Madam President, tomorrow is the first anniversary of the Lehman Brothers collapse, the largest bankruptcy in United States history. Lehman's failure sent shock waves throughout the entire country. The resulting financial meltdown plunged the American economy into the most severe recession since the 1930s. Credit markets froze, investor confidence collapsed, stock prices crashed, and millions of Americans lost their jobs, their homes, and their savings. Lehman brought about its own demise, Madam President. Once the nation's fourth largest investment bank, Lehman allowed a culture of recklessness to engulf its firm. But the blame for this downward spiral and for the consequences to millions of Americans does not end with Lehman, Madam President. At a time when banks were taking an unprecedented risk, our regulatory agencies were taking their referees off the field. The SEC, like other regulatory agencies, has made many mistakes in recent years. From failing to monitor the credit rating agencies and permitting the banks to increase their capital leverage ratios to as high as 30, or 50 to 1, to buy up what turned out to be toxic assets, to removing the uptick rule without putting anything effective in its place, and failing to put in place systems to monitor and adjust its regulations as the market rapidly evolved. Madam President, our nation has paid dearly for these mistakes. In response, we vowed to shine a light on Wall Street, to enact financial regulatory reforms, to push for clearer and enforceable laws, to strengthen our oversight agencies, all in an effort to prevent history from repeating itself and to rebuild the credibility of and investor confidence in our markets. But our actions have not yet followed our words. President Obama has proposed a new financial regulation plan that would enforce stricter capital and liquidity requirements for investment banks revamp the disjointed regulatory system, and impose higher standards for risky products like credit default swaps. I applaud President Obama's efforts to address the regulatory problems that devastate our economy, and I look forward to working with my colleagues to create a systemic risk regulator, to regulate derivatives effectively, and to ensure consumer financial protections. But we cannot simply react to problems after they have occurred. We must also adopt a forward-looking approach to regulation that recognizes manipulation and wrongdoing while it is happening and stops it dead in its tracks. Because of the damage that was done to our economy by the prior financial scandals, the regulatory agencies in Congress need to catch up and redress prior mistakes, while at the same time focus on current questionable market practices before new problems arise. Since I became a senator in January, I've been spending much of my time in Congress asking questions and promoting regulatory solutions to current questionable practices on Wall Street. And I have stressed repeatedly the need for the SEC to step forward as a strong and determined cop on the beat. Madam President, I believe to the bottom of my being that democracy and fair markets are the foundation of our American society. They are both based on the notions of equality and fairness, the idea that all Americans have an equal opportunity to succeed. For markets to have credibility, investors to have confidence, Congress and the SEC must act urgently to restore a level playing field for all investors. If investors don't believe the markets are fair, they won't invest in them. It is as simple as that. Fairness may be an ever-changing and elusive concept when it comes to financial markets, but it must be defined and then defended by the regulators. Where abuses continue in our financial markets, those abuses must be addressed through clear rules, with teeth, and through tough enforcement. Otherwise, we will be left with two financial markets. One market for huge volume, high-speed players who can take advantage of every loophole for profit, and another market for retail investors whose orders are seemingly filled as an afterthought without any special priority. For example, since March, I've worked with a bipartisan group of centers to push the SEC to do more about abusive or so-called naked short selling. 
When Lehman Brothers began to go down, many believe naked short sellers drove it into its grave, profiting handsomely by manipulating the price of Lehman stock down, 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 down. The SEC will be holding a roundtable on September 30th to discuss pre-bar requirements and centralized hard locate system solutions that I and other centers have proposed. I strongly, I strongly urge the Commission to propose new rules addressing these issues and to begin to elicit serious comments about their effectiveness. At the very least, they should set up pilot programs to test how they might work. Otherwise, if the SEC does nothing, I'm concerned that when the conditions for profit profitable naked short selling reoccur, and they will reoccur, there will be no enforceable rules to stop it. And the SEC will be unable to punish those who undertake it, just as the SEC has yet to punish anyone, punish anyone for the naked short selling events last year. More recently, several questionable market structure issues have come to light threatening Martin fairness in ways we are only beginning to understand. Wall Street has undergone a radical transformation in only the last few years, Madam President. Only a few years ago, powerful trading organizations like the New York Stock Exchange handled over 80% of all transactions. Today, the market is currently heavily fragmented and dominated by high-frequency traders. According to research by the TAB Group, there are now over 50 trading venues in the United States. Technologically advanced high frequency trading firms now represent over 61% of the daily trading volume in stocks. Institutional investors prefer to trade in dark liquidity pools, which arguably violate the spirit of rules that require fair and non-discriminatory access to quotations. Madam President, these innovations from market fragmentation to high-speed electronic trading have produced benefits including increased liquidity, narrowed spreads, and lowered commissions for most investors. But, and this is a big but, while competition and innovation have flourished, the fundamental fairness of our markets cannot be taken for granted. Actions by the SEC over recent decades have had the unintended consequence of producing markets that now seem to favor the most technologically sophisticated traders, sometimes at the expense of ordinary retail investors. Moreover, competition for market trading volume among market centers now includes questionable practices such as liquidity rebates, flash order offerings, co-location servers, and other inducement arrangements with broker dealers and other market participants. Congress, the SEC, and the public, they serve need to stand back and better understand what has happened. Even for the skilled insiders, it is all very complicated and very opaque. And the challenge we face is to understand the benefits, costs, and risk of these developments to long-term investors in a market environment very different from just five years ago. This is recently why I recently called on the SEC to undertake a comprehensive review of a broad range of market issues, analyzing the current market structure from the ground up before piecemeal changes built on the current structure add to the potential for execution fairness and the creation of a house of cards. I am concerned that questionable practices threaten to further erode investor confidence in our financial markets and that our understanding and regulatory capability have not kept pace with those changes. To her credit, Madam President, SEC Chairman Shapiro, for whom I have great respect, as well as for the urgent task she confronts in this challenging era for the Commission, has begun such a review and has agreed to broaden it. In her letter responding to my concerns, she too recognizes the trade-off between liquidity and fairness, as well as the importance of standing up for the interests of long-term investors. She wrote, and I quote, if the interests of long-term investors and professional short-term traders conflict, the Commission previously emphasized that, quote, its clear responsibility is to uphold the interest of long-term investors, unquote. I firmly agree that the Commission's focus must be on the protection of long-term investors, unquote. 
Alan Greenspan, the former Fed chairman, in commenting on the fixed income markets, learned this lesson too late. Technological developments without effective regulation do not always lead to the best interest of the investors. He wrote, and I quote again, all of the sophisticated mathematics and computer wizardry essentially rested on one central premise, that enlightened self-interest of owners and managers of financial institutions would lead them to maintain a sufficient buffer against insolvency by actively monitoring and managing their firm's capital and risk positions, unquote. The premise failed in the summer of 2007, the former Fed chairman said, leaving him deeply dismayed. That's a quote, deeply dismayed. We are all deeply dismayed, Madam President, and we don't ever want to be so dismayed again. So recent developments in the equity and options market are very different from what happened in the fixed income markets. Congress must exercise its oversight capacity to lay out the issues and ask the tough questions about high-frequency trading and recent market structure issues. High-frequency traders have many tools at their disposal that give them significant advantage over regular investing. The first is speed. In order to receive information as quickly as possible, high-speed firms place their computer servers right next to the exchange's computers. Co-locating allows them to receive information a few milliseconds before the rest of the world. Because in the modern world, every millisecond is critical in the world of high-frequency trading, firms are willing to pay millions of dollars annually for the advantage of co-location. Information on price movement and market trends is routed directly to electronic algorithms designed by top engineers to make trades automatically. These programs rely on the rapid acquisition of information in order to read the markets and execute trades instantaneously, sometimes as many as 1,000 times in a single second. To prevent abuse, the SEC must ensure, quote, fair access, unquote, for co-located servers at the exchanges and a method of allocation that does not disadvantage retail orders. Another advantage for insiders in the new system, Madam President, arises from what we know as market latency disparities. Market fragmentation appears to permit high-speed traders to use the disparities in time, place, speed, and price to advantage themselves over unsuspecting investor. Let me read from a recent article in the magazine The Economist entitled, quote, Rise of the Machines, unquote. And they say, and I quote, high-frequency traders attempt to cover how much an investor is willing to pay or sell for by sending out a stream of probing quotes that is swiftly canceled until they elicit a response. The traders then buy or short the targeted stock ahead of the investor, offering it to them at a fraction of a second later for a tidy profit." Unquote. The main point to remember is while the cost of each individual might be, sl individual might be slight, the TAB Group estimates that high-speed stock traders banked about $8 billion in profits last year. Let me repeat, $8 billion with a B. How much of this profit came from legitimate practices that benefited all investors, and how much of it was a toll paid by the average investor? We all know the old adage, Madam President, it's easier to steal a penny or two from 100 million people than to steal a million dollars from one person. We need to know if high-speed traders are proving this to be true in our markets every day. Some market practices have also introduced potential conflict of interest in the marketplace. For example, trading venues offer rebates to investors who post limit orders, which bring liquidity to their exchange and charge for market orders, which take liquidity out of the exchange. Some broker-dealer firms direct a sizable majority of their order flow to the exchanges that offer the highest payments and lowest fees. In theory, best ex execution is always a first priority, as regulations clearly state that even if the customer's order is routed to a market that does not have the best price, it must be rerouted to the market center that does. I am concerned that regulators are outmatched by the rapid advantages, advantages in high-speed trading. In a highly fragmented system where millions of trades take place in a microsecond, the ability to measure and enforce so-called best execution may be a vain hope. The so-called Rule 605 forms, 
which purport to measure execution quality, are woefully outdated. The first column for time of execution reads zero to nine seconds. In a gap of nine seconds, prices under the new system can change significantly. In a world of 50 market venues with structural latency issues being targeted by an entire industry of high frequency traders, millions of trades reaping millions of dollars can take place before retail investors and the regulators who protect their interests can comprehend what happened. We need to ask if regulators are looking through the wrong end of a telescope when they should be using a microscope. Average investors must now wonder if their orders are being routed to a venue because it offers the best execution quality for them or because it leads to the most revenue or lowest transaction fees for their brokers. Liquidity rebates paid by exchanges have increased trade volume and thereby provided avid, added revenue for the exchanges. Most of the traders who capitalize on rebates are high-frequency traders who execute millions of low-risk trades a day. These market participants are not investors. Rather, they step in between buy and sell orders, trade on both sides of a security, and cash in on double the rebate. Let me again read from The Economist quote. Another popular high-frequency trading strategy is to collect rebates the exchanges offers to liquidity providers. High-frequency traders will quickly outbid investors before immediately selling the shares to the investor at a slightly higher purchase price, collecting a rebate of one quarter of a cent in both trades, unquote. Some argue that such innovations add needed liquidity to the market, but high street traders mainly target the most frequently traded stocks. Liquidity is light and spreads are wide on many lower volume stocks. We must rigorously examine the degree to which rebates actually bring liquidity to the marketplace where it is needed and help the market function properly. Madam President, I discussed a variety of questionable practices that deserve and I hope receive a searching examination by the Securities Exchange Commission and by Congress. While some of these innovations have produced benefits, they have also created wide disparities between high-speed traders and average investors. We do not have a clear accounting of all the costs and benefits of these recent mar market structure changes. Under the current system, Madam President, until empirical data shows up to dispel our concerns, we have little reason to believe average investors can compete with the high-speed traders they are up against. We must question whether certain broker-dealers are acting in the best interest of their customers under cover of flawed regulation and antiquated enforcement techniques. At the same time, we have dark trading platforms that are insufficiently monitored by regulators and which undermine public price discovery. Moreover, unlike specialists and traditional market makers that are regulated, some of these new high-frequency traders are unregulated, that they are acting as a market-making capacity. They have no requirement to maintain a fair and orderly market. They trade when it benefits them. If we experience another shock to the financial system, will this new and dominant type of pseudo-market maker act in the interest of the markets when we really need them? Will they step up and maintain a two-sided market, or will they simply shut off the machines and walk away? Even worse, will they seek even further profit and exacerbate the downside? Because our rules and regulations are so inept, most of the practices I've mentioned today are still legal, but they clearly are not fair. It used to be that steroids were not banned in Major League Baseball. In fact, they were great for business. The game's biggest sluggers had home runs at an unprecedented rate, enthralling fans in the process. But the game was tainted. The competition was unfair. And the power was not genuine. Eventually, the game suffered a crisis of legitimacy. High-frequency trading, while not illegal, may operate in ways that undermine the legitimacy of our financial markets. In order to restore investor confidence, we must effectively regulate unfair performance enhancers. We must shine a light on dark pools, conduct a searching examination of high-frequency trading strategies to ensure they are not manipulative, ban flash orders, and give regulators the tools they need to ensure that broker-dealers are acting in the best interest of their clients. Madam President, I know as, uh, know as well as anyone the benefits of free market. I know that technology, innovation, and competition are critical components of economic growth. 
but we must balance those interests, Madam President, against the values of fairness and equal opportunity. We must bring back a level playing field, encourage long-term investment, and help our economy grow. I am not here today, Madam President, to stand in the way of progress. I do not wish to return to a horse and buggy system. High frequency trading and the rise of the machines, as the economists called it, are here to stay. I don't want to ban them. I don't want to slow them down. Simply put, technolo technological development should not control our regulatory destiny. Rather, our regulatory agents should ensure that technological process, progress everywhere bring, bring benefit to long-term investors. And where the interests of the two are in conflict, our regulators must stop the practice of professional short traders that harm the interests of long-term investors. The market structure rules themselves should not enshrine or permit illicit advantages that a careful review, a surgeon's scalpel, electronically constructed solutions, and effective enforcement can end. Neither should the needed exclusions that protect investor interests like reinstatement of some form of the uptick or bid test or the need for a hard locate requirement and naked short selling once and for all remain unused primarily in deference to the desires and convenience of high frequency traders. For our part, we in Congress need to undertake a fundamental review of the oversight responsibilities we give to regulators, examining whether they have adequate tools to carry out these responsibilities. We have become complacent in thinking that continually updating our body of regulations is enough, when in reality, we perhaps have failed to provide regulators with the necessary tools they need to observe these complex financial institutions. So, on this first anniversary of Lehman Brothers collapse, I conclude by saying I look forward to working with my colleagues, not only to address the financial crisis of the past, but also to scrutinize and begin to correct the financial abuses of the present so we can avoid the problems of the future.